A question I'm asked not infrequently is, can you tell me why climate change is actually bad? Like, I think the whole thing's overblown. How is it going to impact my life? And there are lots of ways to answer that question. You could talk about threats to food security from droughts and heat waves. You could talk about fragility in the global biosphere because of species loss, or geopolitical tensions because of mass migration caused by climate extremes. But this week specifically, I want to give a more specific answer. Health. And there are two reasons to do so this week specifically. Firstly, in Dubai, COP28 is happening. And for the first time ever, they have a day focusing on the impacts of climate change on global health. But secondly, some huge new research has just been published, focusing on the impacts of climate change on health. Now, climate change has some very obvious impacts on health. Heat, for example. As the global temperature rises and extreme events become more extreme and more frequent, more people will be affected by conditions like heat stroke. As precipitation patterns change and extremes get more extreme, more people will be affected by flooding, which poses a direct risk to life but also a secondary risk through waterborne diseases. We define the excess mortality of climate change as those deaths which have occurred due to the emission of carbon dioxide and raising of the global temperature that would not have happened in a world where we didn't change the climate. But this misses some of the health burden of climate change because many of the secondary impacts of climate change are non-lethal. And while a large part of this excess mortality will be due to those quite obvious factors, a lot of it is due to secondary effects, things like changing patterns of tropical diseases reaching into the mid-latitudes, but also things like changes in renal disease or allergies, or an area that is very under-researched, the impact of climate change on mental health. For a good review of this, the medical journal The Lancet publishes an annual publication called The countdown, which analyzes the overall burden of climate change on global health. There'll be a link in the description. But the largest, most pressing stress that climate change puts on global health is air pollution. From a health point of view, we're interested in contaminants in the air that are toxic. So CO2, um, you know, for example, is very problematic for climate change point of views, but it's not directly toxic uh, to humans unless it's at extremely high, high concentrations. So we're um, mostly, if you look at what governments regulate on the basis of protecting public health, it's certain pollutants that include particles, so particulate matter, uh, which is a combination, it's a sort of mixture of things, some solid, some condensed liquid uh, as well. And we're interested in particles that are of a certain size. So we focus a lot on the smaller particles that can go directly into where the air exchange happens in our lungs. So that's what we refer to as PM2.5. This is Professor Catherine Tunney, one of the authors of an international study published this week in the British Medical Journal, analyzing the impact of burning fossil fuels on global health, and specifically looking at the role of PM2.5 air pollution. This is produced in the incomplete combustion of fuels, and so is added to the atmosphere when we burn coal, oil and gas, and their derived products, for heating, transport and electricity. We breathe them in and uh, they interact uh, at the, as I mentioned, with these smaller particles. They go directly down into uh, basically the alveoli where we uh, are exchanging oxygen for CO2 and can have some direct response in the lungs. But what we see is that particle exposure triggers many uh, systemic processes. So you get inflammation, you get oxidative stress, you get many things that affect the whole body. Air pollution is not just an issue for the lungs, but it's, it's essentially associated with almost every disease you can think of. Um, in a way, I think it's useful to think of smoking. We know smoking is basically bad for pretty much everything. Fertility, your skin, uh, premature aging. Air pollution is, is a lot like smoking. These are products of incomplete combustion, just at much uh, lower concentration than when you're actually uh, actively smoking. So the big question, how many people die every year because of exposure to PM2.5 in the air they breathe and the resulting heart attacks and strokes? So there are different estimates, um, but most of them sort of range, uh, but they're, they're all in the several millions of deaths per year. So roughly between four and eight, uh, using uh, different methods basically to estimate the, the, the attributable mortality burden to air pollution. So it's huge. It's really a large, a large number. And to be very clear, this isn't just a problem in places that you may think of as having very polluted air, like China or Korea. This is a global problem because exposure to even relatively low concentrations of PM2.5 has significant health impacts. This is a problem that affects you pretty much anywhere you live.
It's a huge public health burden. And just to put it a little bit into perspective, um, you know, if you think about the number of deaths from COVID in 2020, you know, it's somewhere around 3 million, but we have much more than that, even in the lower range, uh, you know, of air pollution related deaths, the estimates, uh, you know, are much more than that. And they happen every year. I previously made a video about air pollution and the health impacts, but I wanted to make this quick video, partly because of the timing and partly because this research takes things a step further than what I talked about in that video and asks, what happens to the excess mortality if we stop burning fossil fuels? Because PM2.5 pollution comes from both anthropogenic and natural sources. Sea salts, windblown dust, pollen. So not all of those deaths would be avoided if we stopped burning fossil fuels. The question is, how many? And how do you work that out? So the way we typically approach this is um, through some sort of modeling where we have an, an idea of the emissions. So how much air pollution are this, this fossil fuel burning putting into the atmosphere? And then basically modeling how that those emissions move around in terms of dispersion and transport across the planet. There's a lot of atmospheric chemistry that goes on and that's what we're breathing. And then we use evidence from the epidemiological literature, which tells us for a unit increase in exposure to air pollution, how much increase in mortality in this case would be estimate. So linking together this sort of models on the exposure side with the epidemiology allows us then to estimate uh, the, uh, the number of deaths that you could expect under a certain exposure. And essentially what we estimated is that you would save essentially 5 million deaths per year, 61% of that total burden from, from air pollution. So there's some other contribution there that's other anthropogenic air pollution uh, as, as well as the natural component. 5 million deaths avoidable every single year. To put that in perspective, that's like every single person in a country the size of New Zealand dying every single year due to breathing in the byproducts of burning fossil fuels. And as I already said, there are many, many other forms of mortality linked to burning fossil fuels and the resulting climate change. Which brings us to COP28. And for the first time, a day in which they weigh the impact of climate change on global health. Is, is it fair to ask you, for another wasted, ineffective COP, how many more lives are, are wasted? How many, how many more people will die because of climate inaction that will take place this week? So it's several million lives, um, and, and that's not considering uh, basically the other diseases. But, you know, I, according to the, the paper that we just published, it's about five million lives. That's the true cost of delay uh, by not phasing out fossil fuels one more year. And what would you want to say to world leaders? If, if you were on the, the podium at COP28 and had the chance to address all the, the heads of state, what would you want to say to them? Uh, that the climate crisis is a health crisis and that it's, you know, the negotiation is not just about, uh, you know, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. It's about how many lives are, are basically at stake in these negotiations. And it's a huge number. And that should, you know, I think really shift the dialogue. COP28 is a shambles. And frankly, so are COPs in general at this point. If you're not aware, for the past several years, fossil fuel lobby groups have been one of the largest delegations at these conferences designed to combat climate change. I'm sure that has nothing to do with the persistent lack of ambition about phasing out fossil fuels or the watering down of language, or the fact that this year the hosts, the UAE, have been doing behind the scenes deals to expand the use of fossil fuels and lock countries into their use going forwards. Oh wait, no, those two are obviously connected. This year, as with previous years, activists and scientists will be invited to COP and they will repeat their demands for the phase out of fossil fuels, that this is a crisis and we need to do something immediately. And government officials will agree. They will nod their heads and say, yes, this is very important. And then they'll go home and they will enact policy that doesn't reflect this. Our very own Prime Minister, Inaction Man himself, has said that the UK has a great track record at these conferences and we should be proud of what we are doing to combat climate change, and yet has consistently rolled back policies designed to reduce emissions, and has in fact leaned into the culture war propagated by right-wing media in order to appeal to his ignorant, ageing voter base. The Prime Minister and leaders around the world are not acting on the advice of their scientific advisors. They are acting on the advice of their financiers. 
and I don't mean they're economists trying to improve the paychecks of people who actually live in their countries, no. They're doing this to try and improve their own bank accounts, and the bank accounts of people who have put them into power. And nowhere is this more obvious than in Dubai this year. Like, I'm glad that these news stories have come out. I'm glad that these behind-the-scenes deals have become public knowledge, because they were always going to happen. I didn't have a doubt in my mind that this is what was going to happen at COP this year. I'm just glad they got caught. This year will be another year of wasted opportunities, of inaction and insufficient ambition around the phase-out of fossil fuels. And it will kill millions of people. We often frame inaction on climate change as making the future worse, that by not taking action today we will make the world that my daughter will live in worse. And this is of course correct, it is making that future worse. But it ignores the harm being done in the present. A small country is dying every single year because of air pollution caused by burning fossil fuels. And the industry that's producing that pollution is being actively supported by world governments. 7% of global GDP is spent on subsidies for the fossil fuel industry. The previous video on this channel detailed a version of the 21st century in which millions perish. Hundreds of millions are displaced, wars occur. And that is the good version of this century. The version that we're basically already committed to, the version that is still possible if we take immediate ambitious action to phase out the use of fossil fuels. But failure this year in Dubai by the people who represent you and me, as I fear will be inevitable, will only drag us further from that future and towards something much, much bleaker. And I don't know about you, but that pisses me off. I'm sure there'll be some people watching this, maybe even some people at COP, who will ask, but what about the social cost of carbon? Is it really worth spending all this money to transition away from using fossil fuels and some deaths to avoid the annihilation of the natural world, the very systems that we depend on? I want to be very clear. Millions of lives are lost every year, and we can prevent that. And also prevent so much more. We can safeguard society as we know it. We can prevent a mass extinction occurring on a geological scale. And if you think that arguing over change is more important than that, then you are a ghoul. I question not only your humanity, but your basic reasoning. If delegates at COP28 do not demand a phase out of fossil fuels and an immediate transition to a decarbonized economy, then they will have to weigh millions of lives every year on their conscience. And if they don't make such demands, we'll know why. It's, you know, it's something that I think about all the time and that, you know, how do we convey the sense of urgency uh, that everyone seems to understand with COVID-19, you know, but this is, this is, this is a crisis. This is an emergency. We should have the same sense of urgency about, uh, about climate change and about uh, air pollution. And uh, I think this is, you know, why we keep trying to get the numbers out and get attention about just the scale of the uh, the health burden of of air pollution because it's huge and I think it's uh, you know not something that people that's at the top of their mind very often but it but it should be based on the numbers it absolutely should be this is a crisis we should we should be you know treating it like one. This was an unusual video for me and I I think I've made it because I've had enough. Making the previous video on this channel just snapped the future into focus for me, and it made the idea, the seemingly inevitable idea, of failure at COP28 impossible to bear. I believe that COPs can accomplish the change that we need. In fact, they may be the only way that we can coordinate global climate policy in a meaningful way. The systems are in place. The Paris Agreement was a good start. What we now need is for the delegates at these conferences to take the problem as seriously as it deserves. Because, as we've learned in this video, millions of lives are on the line. And I don't mean in the future, I mean now. I don't have a sponsor to promote or a call to action at the end of this video. My call to action is for you to take this problem seriously. And yes, there are things we can do as individuals to do that. We can not fly, we can eat vegan, we can get our electricity from renewable sources. But the most important thing we can do as individuals is to hold our governments to account. If, as I fear is inevitable, they fail in Dubai this year, 
don't let them get away with it. You have a democratic voice. I suggest you use it. Thanks must go to Professor Tane for agreeing to be interviewed by me, and also to you. Thank you for watching. If you haven't already seen it, please do go watch my previous video on the optimistic version of the 21st century. It's the biggest, best thing I think I've ever made. I was only able to make that video with the support of my patrons, and that also goes for this video. The names of my executive producer patrons are on screen right now. If you would like to help me make more and better videos, then you'll find a link to my Patreon down in the description. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one, where hopefully I'll have calmed down a little bit.